How's it going you guys and welcome to the start of my tutorial series. This is something that I've wanted to do for a while and a few people have asked me to do it or at least do some more build videos, see how I build. So that's what I want to do for you guys. And one thing that I want to emphasize throughout this series is that more than a tutorial, this is basically just going to show you guys how I do things. I don't want it to necessarily be a tutorial in the sense that I want to teach you guys because honestly I'm not really an expert. I have my own way of doing things that are, um, while a lot of them may be the correct way to do things, there is a lot of different ways to do different steps and everyone has a little bit different methods. So basically I'm just showing you guys the way that I go about doing it. If you pick up something new um, that you want to try, that's great. Or if you have different techniques that you think I should try, let me know in the comments below. I'm still learning and I think even some of the top modelers will probably still tell you that they're still learning too. Really, as a Gunpla modeler, that's what it's all about. It's all just a learning process. Everyone has to start with the basics, and everyone has the ability to improve. One thing I want to avoid in this series is terms like beginner or intermediate or professional level of techniques, because you shouldn't worry about defining your skill into one of those levels. Maybe if you consider yourself a beginner and I'm showing you an intermediate technique, then you might think, oh, I'm not really ready for that yet. But the point I will really want to make in these videos is that basic things that you can do to really make your Gunpla look a lot better are really not all that difficult and you shouldn't really be afraid to try them even if you consider yourself a beginner even if you've only built a couple of kits these are some things that are really super simple to do the materials don't cost a lot of money and it's gonna make your finished product look a whole lot better the other thing that I wanna say before we get started is that if I miss anything which I'm sure I will Guys, please leave questions below and I'll try to get to it in the next video or I'll just respond to your question directly. I'm sure there's a lot of things that I'll just kind of miss along the way, but I'm going to try to give you as thorough coverage as I can as to just what I know about building and what I do when I'm building kits. Now as far as what we're going to actually cover in this series, we're going to start off with just basic prep work. That's just getting the kit ready to just start building it. Then we're going to cover cutting and cleaning nubs. Again, that's just like the super basic first steps. Then we're going to cover seam lines. That's one thing that I think will be really helpful for a lot of you who might consider yourself a beginner. Fixing seam lines is really a lot easier than it looks, and it's something that really helps a lot. Then we're going to cover some painting. And while there are a lot of ways to go about painting, the best would probably be airbrushing or hand painting if you're really good at it. As of yet, I don't have an airbrush, so when I do and when I feel skilled enough, I'll do more airbrush kind of tutorials much later. But for now, what we're going to cover in this series is painting with spray cans like this and, and enamels like this. We'll cover more of that stuff later. Then we're going to go over how to do panel lining and next applying stickers and decals and finally top coating your kit. Now before we get started, I think one thing that it's important to go over, especially if you're just getting into the hobby, is the terminology. So the first thing I want to talk about with you guys is the different grades of Gunpla. There are a lot of different grades and some of the terminology might be confusing for people who are just getting into the hobby, so let's quickly take a look at those. Starting off with what is probably the most common line among Gunpla is the high grade line. High grade or HG as you'll see here on the box are always in 1 to 144 scale. One thing you should always look for on any grade of Gunpla as well is the Bandai marking here in the corner. Over the years there have been a very few slight variations to the Bandai design, but if it doesn't have any sort of Bandai logo there or if it's different, then it's a bootleg or a knockoff and therefore not as good. Taking a closer look, below where it says HG, it will give what universe the mobile suit is from. So this particular mobile suit is the Jagan, which is from the Universal Century or UC Timeline. Other kits like this Red Warrior will say HG Build Fighters, indicating that this kit or this design is from the Build Fighters timeline. In the bottom corner of the front of the box you should also see what year the kit was produced. As you can see this kit was produced in 2009. On the side of the kit you can usually also find the number in the series, so in the high grade Universal Century line this is number 97, whereas in the high grade Build Fighters line this is number 26. Then on the top or bottom of the kit, wherever you can find the barcode on the kit, the last four numbers should indicate the price. 
Sometimes with more expensive kits, it may be actually five numbers, but in this case, it's 1500, indicating that the Japanese suggested retail price is 1,500 yen. Next is the real grade line, otherwise known as RG. These kits are also in 1 to 144 scale, but where they differ from high grade kits, these kits are much, much more detailed, they'll have much more part separation, and they'll also feature an inner frame. Most features of the box are the same, with the Bandai logo in one corner, the year the model was produced in another corner, 2014 for this particular model, and then here under the RG logo, rather than getting the century or the timeline where this model was from, or where this mobile suit was from, instead we have excitement embodied, which is basically just the catchphrase for the RG line. On the top, once again, you can find the price located next to the barcode. For this one was 2,500 yen. Next is the first grade line, otherwise known as FG. This line is mostly limited to mobile suits from Gundam Seed, Gundam Double O, and Gundam Age. Once again, these are in 1 to 144 scale, as noted clearly on the box. But where these differ from high grade and real grade is that they are super, super simple in design. The articulation will be very limited. The parts count will be very limited as well. And it will have very basic accessories. All the same rules apply for markings on this kit. First grade here, Bandai. The year the kit was produced, 2007, and above the barcode, the price. One good point about first grade kits is that the price is usually very low, only 700 yen in this case. Next is the non-grade line, sometimes noted as NG. What makes a kit a non-grade is basically just the fact that it has no grade. If you look at the cover of this box, you'll find no markings like we've seen before with the high grade, real grade, and first grade. Therefore, this would be a non-grade kit. This particular kit is a 1 to 144 scale kit, but non-grade kits can also be found in the 1 100 scale as well as the 1 60th scale. Non-grade kits usually fall somewhere between first grade and high grade. The details and articulation of the kit may differ a lot depending on the design, the series, or the day the kit was produced. But essentially these kits will have decent articulation, decent weapons, but will overall be of a lower quality than high grade. One advantage of the non-grade line is that many kits released as a non-grade often do not have another release in any of the other lines. So if there's a particular design that you like that's available in non-grade, chances are it might not be available in any other way. And once again, information found in the box is usually going to be very standard. Once again, with the date, the Bandai logo, it should indicate the scale there. and above the barcode, you can find the price. Next is the Master Grade, otherwise known as the MG. This is the primary grade for kits that are in 1 to 100 scale. These kits will feature much more articulation, detail, accessories, part separation, and markings either in the form of decals or stickers. While this is the normal box size for most normal older Master Grades, the box size can vary quite a bit among Master Grade kits. All of the information found on the box is once again going to be the same, going from Master Grade in here, once again only getting Master Grade below the logo, at the bottom Bandai, in the corner the date, and above the barcode the price. One thing I do want to note is that kits that are premium Bandai, as in kits sold only through Bandai's official web shop in Japan, will have the price here as well. However, exclusive or limited kits that are only sold at Gumpla Expos will not have a price there. Next is the Mega Size model. Now this is essentially the largest model kits that you can buy. There is also a Jumbo scale, but we won't be covering that. The Mega Size model kits are in 1 to 48 scale, so they are quite large and at the time of recording this video, there are really only a handful of kits in this scale. And while the scale is quite large, the details on the kit, as far as panel lines and other small details, will be very nice. Overall, the articulation will be quite limited. These models aren't really made to be very poseable or great to play with, putting them in very dynamic poses, etc. But mostly just to stand there and look very intimidating for their size. Everything on the box will be the same from the Mega Size Model logo here, the date here, the Bandai logo there, and above the barcode will be the price as well. And last but certainly not least would be the perfect grade line. 
perfect grade, otherwise known as PG, are in 1 to 60th scale. That makes them quite large, not as large as mega size models, but what makes perfect grades so special is that they feature a very, very high number of parts. That means the amount of detail will be very incredible. The inner frame of the mobile suit will be very complex, and it will feature a lot of part separation among the armor. Most perfect grades also have a feature to put in an LED unit, and while the price tag of perfect grade kits is usually very high, the finished result is undoubtedly worth the price. So now that you know about grades, let's cover some other terminology important for Gunpla modeling. When you open your box of Gunpla, the first things that you're going to pull out are going to be these. Now these are often called runners, sprues, trees, or probably some other names that I don't know about. I call these runners, so that's what you'll be hearing from me. Here on the runner, the parts are connected by what's known as a gate. A gate is where the plastic flows through these channels into the mold of the part itself. The gate is where you'll be cutting the part away from the runner. Once you've cut a part off, these small bits left behind are called nubs. We'll cover much more about these later and how to clean them up in a future video. There are a few different types of stickers and decals. The first one being foil stickers. Foil stickers are usually printed in this very shiny way. Foil stickers you can simply peel off and put directly onto the model. Next we have this type of sticker which is usually printed on a blue sheet. RG kits will have a lot of stickers as well as some master grade, high grade and other kits will also have some stickers. Like the foil stickers, these you can simply peel off and put directly onto the model. Next we have dry transfer decals. These will primarily be found in master grade kits but can sometimes be found in other kits as well. These are easily identifiable by the fact that they have this wax paper behind them and the decals are printed on this clear sheet. You want to be careful to keep those together. And last we have water slide decals. These will almost always be printed on this blue paper as well. But unlike stickers, you can't just peel these off by hand. These you'll have to actually use water to put them onto the kit, hence the name water slide decals. But anyway, more on all of those later. Next I want to go over some of just a few of the basic tools that we're going to need for building Gunpla. The first and one of the most important would be these, which are side cutters or nippers or clippers or cutters or they may be called many different names but basically these are what you're going to use to cut the parts from the runners. Next we have a hobby knife. This is equally as important as the cutters as this will probably be the number one tool that you'll be using other than cutters. There are quite a few different kinds of hobby knives. This is the hobby knife that I prefer. It is a Tamiya modeler's knife. You can buy one of these new coming with one of these packs of replacement blades and then once you have the knife you can just buy the packs themselves. This pack is very useful as when you slide it open you can put the used blades in here into one side to keep them safely in there instead of just chucking them in your trash and then the new blades are here you can just take one out. Those will go into your knife by unscrewing this. You can pull it out and then put it back in or put a new one in. Next is going to be sandpaper or sanding sticks. There's a lot, a lot of different kinds of sandpaper and sanding sticks and many different sorts of size, shapes, and grades. The grade of the sandpaper will determine the roughness of it. The higher the number, the softer it is, the lower the number, the more coarse or the more grainy the sand will be. And we'll cover sanding a little bit more in a future video. Next we have glue. This is probably the most common type of glue that I use most of the time is Tamiya Extra Thin Cement. It's very very watery, basically like water. When you unscrew the cap, there is a brush on the end that you will use for applying the glue. I do also have this Tamiya cement which is much thicker and I find it takes much much longer to cure so I often don't really use this one. There will also be times when you can use super glue and basically any kind of super glue will work. Tamiya does sell a glue that is basically like super glue. 
otherwise just any sort of super glue that you can find. And the last one for now is going to be files. Now files come in many different shapes and sizes and as you can see mine are pretty well used and kind of dirty. But files are very very useful in a lot of different ways. More for customizing your kit but there are plenty of uses in just basic Gumpla building as well. Alright so now that we've covered the basics of the different scales and grades of Gumpla and some of the basics on the terminology of the tools and things you're going to be working with it's time to get started with building. For this series we're going to be building this kit which is the high grade Universal Century Yakadoga and we're going to be covering all the previously mentioned steps to make this kit look as good as we possibly can and see what we come up with. So we've got our model kit and we're ready to start building. First thing we're going to do is pop the top open and inside you'll see all the parts are contained within these plastic bags. Now as I already filmed an unboxing for this in preparation, all the bags are already cut. What we're going to do is just go ahead and separate these. When you pull the runners out of the bags, always check the bags before you throw them away. Sometimes a part may come loose off the runner and just be floating in the bag. You wouldn't want to throw away the bag and put together your kit and then realize you're missing a piece that you accidentally threw away. And what we want to do first is separate the runners from the other things that are not basic runners. So like these foil decals, we want to put these off to the side. Poly caps and beam saber effect parts we can also put to the side. These rods as well. Normal runners here. Okay, so we've got our runners all here and then everything else here in the box, the manual and the other stuff. The reason that we're separating them is because before you start building the kit, it's important to wash your runners. Now this is something I'll definitely admit I am guilty of not doing this all the time. You should do this every time. The reason is that when these runners are pressed in the factory, the plastic is left a little bit dirty from the molding process. So in order to make sure all of our work goes well, we want to just make sure the parts are really clean to start off. And there's a lot of ways to go about washing your runners. I just do mine in my kitchen sink, but a lot of people have their own ways of washing the runners. Now like I said, my sink is large enough to fit most runners in there. If your sink is not, you can also use any sort of kind of plastic tub or any other sort of method of soaking and washing your parts. Now I just use a small bowl to block the drain. That's for two reasons. The first reason being that I lost the plug for that. The second reason being that it blocks the flow of water enough that the sink can fill up. But the water does go out slowly so that means I can let my parts sit in the water for a while and then the water will just slowly go out on its own and then I can just come back and get them later and just take them out. So the first thing we want to do is just get some water going, make sure it gets hot. Not super hot, but you just want it to be warm enough. Once you get the water going, I'll just take some dish soap and just kind of squirt it around in there. And then sort of swirl the water a bit as it's filling up to get the water nice and soapy. Next, as I start to put the runners in the water, I'm going to use this to sort of scrub this soapy water a little bit on the parts carefully because a lot of these small parts you want to make sure they're not going to fly off and get lost in your water. So we'll just go ahead and start doing some of this while running the water over the parts as well. Right, so now my parts are in there, Just I'm going to let them soak a bit in this soapy water. And like I said, because my drain is not totally stopped, the water will just go out on its own. I can come back in 10 or 15 minutes and the water will be out. I can rinse the parts and let them dry. And here's a towel that I've got laid out where I can simply place my parts to let them dry. Right, so all my runners are now dry and we're back at the desk and ready to start building, right? Not quite yet. 
Before we start building, it's important to organize everything. That'll make your building process much easier and much quicker. Here's how I like to organize everything when I'm getting ready to build a kit. The instruction manual, of course, we'll take out because we'll be needing that. The poly caps will also take out. These parts, like effect parts, like these, we can leave in the bottom of the box. Any, sti any stickers or decals that we have, I usually also leave them in the bottom of the box as well, so that way they stay flat until when I need them. I usually take the top of the box and just go ahead and put that underneath. Then if you noticed when we looked at the runners, each runner has a letter on there, A, B, C, D, and so on. Sometimes you'll have runners called A1, A2, A3, like this. But to help make your building process as smooth as possible, it's usually very helpful to put your runners in alphabetical order. That way when you're looking for a part, you can find it very quickly and easily. Now over time you may have seen a lot of different contraptions and different ways of organizing your runners to keep them easily accessible while you're building, but for me the simplest way has always just been to put them in alphabetical order and standing in the box. For example, this is the A runner, so that one will be first in the front. This one is the D runner, so that'll be closer towards the back. C comes before D. F comes after D. And so on, you get the idea. So we end up with something like this. Now the runners are there in order. If I need to get to runner C, I can just flip through here quickly. And here's runner C. Cut the parts, and then when I finish, put it back, and flip them back like that. As for the polycaps, I usually keep them out at all times because this is the runner that you'll probably be going to the most, as for almost every piece that you're building, you'll probably need at least one polycap. The manual I keep off to one side. I like to keep an area of cutting mat open where I'm actually doing the building. I don't like building on top of the instruction manual, not for any particular reason, it's just I don't like it. Now as we open up the manual, you might immediately notice that it's filled with Japanese. You don't need to worry because you really don't have to be able to read or understand any Japanese in order to build the kit. There are a few symbols here that might be sort of confusing, so we'll go over a couple of these first. Here are all the symbols that are possible to be used. The only ones that we're going to be using for this kit are the ones that are in black. The ones that are just in gray means we won't have to actually worry about those symbols for this particular kit but I'll just go ahead and cover them anyway. This particular symbol is one that you probably won't ever see in any Gundam kits, minus the very rare occasion. This means that you'll need to glue something. This second one indicates that you'll have to place a seal or a sticker. Stickers are labeled with Japanese characters, so you don't really have to know the meaning, you just have to be able to recognize the same character here as on your sticker sheet. Next is the symbol for a decal. Unlike stickers, decals are marked with letters, so that should be much easier. Next, this symbol with the two arrows just means that the same will apply to both sides. So if you attach a part onto the left side of a kit, it's just saying that you're going to go ahead and attach that same part onto the right side. This next symbol that looks like elevator doors closing just means that the two parts should be pressed all the way together until there is no gap in between. This exclamation point, as you might imagine, just is an indicator of an important point to make sure you follow in the construction process. Another very self-explanatory one in this picture of a screwdriver indicates that you'll have to use a screw. This picture of the nippers indicates an area where you should be careful of where you cut the part. These can often be found when the nub is located at the end of the peg of a piece where you have to cut the nub without cutting all of the peg of the part. This times two, or it can be times any number actually, just indicates that the step that you're doing currently, you'll do two times, or four times, or ten times. This next one with the large light circle and the small dark circle means something you should do before. And this one with the small light circle and the large dark circle means something you should do after. Before. After. This next symbol with the turn and the 180 degrees means simply that you will turn something 180 degrees. This may also be marked 90 degrees. This symbol with the circle and triangle simply indicates that you have an option of a part. 
So for example, many Zaku kits will come with a normal Zaku head or the option to make a commander type which would have an antenna. So this is just an indicator that you have an option as to which part you want to actually use for your kit. It doesn't matter which one you choose, it's totally up to you. And this last one is also not very common, but it simply means that two different parts will essentially move in the same direction. So for example, you built two feet, but you don't know which one was the left one or which one was the right one. It doesn't matter because they're both moving in the same way. So now that we've covered all the symbols, the next part of the manual will be the parts list. This will show you a picture of all the runners contained within the box. Here you'll see not only the runner letter, but every part is numbered here. One thing that is important to note is that sometimes there will be parts that you will not use. Those parts will be marked with an X. For this kit, that's only here on the polycap runner. You can see there are a few X's there. That means that those polycaps will not be used and we can either just throw those away or I recommend keeping all extra parts just in case you might need them for something in the future. This last section, as it says, for use in Japan only, is, of course, for use in Japan only. This is what is used in case you break or lose some parts. You can request a replacement by filling the information in here, and here it will give you the price of what you'll have to pay for said parts. And one last important aspect of the manual is the color guide. This will give you the exact measurements of how to mix your paint if you want to create the exact colors that you see in the photos. Now the name of the colors here is written in Japanese, but if you cannot read katakana, then you can find these online. But if you are really dedicated, I do recommend just taking a few days to learn katakana. It's really not all that difficult, and it'll be really helpful in this hobby as it will help you to be able to read a lot of words as katakana is used to spell out non-Japanese words. So for example, this first one here is Daytona Green. So that would be Daytona Green. If you can just read katakana, you can figure out what it says. And then here is the percentages for mixing the paint. Now in all honesty, other than those symbols, not a whole lot of that was really all that important as this is basically what's going to be the most important part of the manual for you, which is showing you how to build the kit. Now remember how I said understanding Japanese was not very important? Well, as you can see, in the construction process, there's really not a whole lot of Japanese. Obviously, we'll start from step one, and this has a times two, so that means we're going to be building two of this part. Then moving on to step two. And then here in step three, you can see this number one and number two in the squares. As you can see, that number is exactly the same here. So basically, that's just indicating this part that you built in part number one. We're going to be here and there. And then this part that we built here, number two, is going to be here. And then this little, what looks like a speech bubble, like in a comic book, is what you should do first. So anytime there's that little arrow like that, that means you're going to do this assembly first, then onto the main assembly here. Sometimes you'll have a small diagram like this off to the side, where it's basically just showing you the correct alignment of the parts, so you can make sure that when you've got these parts together, Everything is aligned exactly the way it should be. Just make sure that when you're building it, it looks like it does here in the picture. Here in step four, you can see after we complete this part, we're putting on a few of the outer armor parts onto the chest. Once again, we have a symbol here. This one is the symbol for before. So that means you'll put this front part on first, then the side parts on second. That's easy enough, right? Here in step five are a couple other points that I should mention. If you see those two little dash marks, it sort of looks like quotation marks. Basically that's indicating that you should make sure that the piece is orientated in the way that it shows. This is for the piece for the mono eye, so it's just saying that you should make sure that the mono eye is pointing out as indicated in this small picture here. So usually when there's those two dashes, it matches to a smaller picture that will allow you to check, make sure that everything is in line the way that it's supposed to be. This other Japanese symbol here off to the right side is just supposed to indicate the sound that you should hear when connecting the parts. Pachin is just another word for the click that you should hear when pressing those parts together. So that means you want to press them together firmly until you hear a sound. Here in part six, we're seeing some more symbols in action. Once again, these are the symbols for stickers. So as you can see, this is a sticker with this symbol, which looks like a capital I in English. That would be the symbol for E, 
and then this one would be the symbol for U. Anyway, you just need to find those same symbols here on the sticker sheet. So if we look here, you can see those same symbols appearing here and here. So those are the stickers that we're going to be using. And this symbol here in the middle, remember, it just means that we're going to be doing the same thing on the left side and the right side. So it means we'll be placing one sticker here, this one, and then this one is going to go on the opposite side of that part. So that's it for part one, guys. I know that was really basic, but if any of you are just getting into the hobby, I hope that was helpful. In part two, we'll be moving on with the build.